purpose of this article was to highlight the frequency with which both cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock occur in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. Hello, I'm Jacob Jenser, and I'm a cardiac intensivist at the Mayo Clinic, and I'm here to speak to you about uh, an upcoming article in the December issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings entitled Contemporary Management of Cardiac Arrest and Cardiogenic Shock Complicating Myocardial Infarction. I was the senior author and had the opportunity to collaborate with several uh, excellent co-authors on this very exciting article. Overall, about half of patients with each condition have the other, and many of the patients who have both conditions are overrepresented in the subgroup of patients who die from acute myocardial infarction. Although clinical guidelines talk about the appropriate care of patients with either cardiac arrest or cardiogenic shock, there are a few guideline recommendations that apply directly to the very high risk group that have both conditions. For that purpose, we elected to highlight both the evidence supporting uh, the importance of this combined clinical syndrome as a unique population among those with acute myocardial infarction, and to emphasize where clinical practice guidelines apply to this subgroup. So the key factors that we identified are, first of all, that uh, these patients have a very high risk of adverse outcomes. On average, approximately half of these patients with both cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock in the setting of acute myocardial infarction will die during hospitalization. Second, there are many interacting pathophysiologic mechanisms that affect patients with both conditions, such that each condition worsens the status of the other. Specifically, the process of cardiac arrest and subsequent resuscitation causes a post-arrest syndrome that can exacerbate or trigger cardiogenic shock. Likewise, patients with cardiogenic shock likely have poor cerebral perfusion, which can hamper recovery from cardiac arrest. Another key finding is that when patients have cardiac arrest, one of the key causes of death is anoxic brain injury. And this isn't necessarily something that can be modified directly via standard cardiovascular therapies that we typically use for cardiogenic shock. This is very important because we have to think about ways to protect the brain of which targeted temperature management is considered the current standard of care. One of the most evidence-based strategies for patients with cardiogenic shock caused by acute myocardial infarction is early revascularization. Even in the setting of cardiac arrest, it is recommended to uh, perform early coronary angiography with the plan to do percutaneous revascularization for those who have cardiogenic shock in the setting of a, acute myocardial infarction. It is not clear that patients without an acute myocardial infarction necessarily benefit from coronary angiography in the setting of cardiac arrest. We believe that opening up the culprit vessel is the most important goal of early coronary angiography, and it is unlikely that immediate non-culprit vessel revascularization is beneficial in this context. In any discussion of cardiogenic shock, the concept of mechanical circulatory support is often brought up and emphasized. Clinical trials examining different mechanical circulatory support devices in the setting of cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction have included at least 50% patients with a preceding cardiac arrest. And therefore, these clinical trials apply uh, to patients in this subgroup with both conditions. Unfortunately, none of these clinical trials has shown an improvement in survival with routine use of temporary mechanical circulatory support. For this reason, it is essential to consider temporary mechanical circulatory support on a case-by-case -case basis. And predominantly, we reserve this for patients who are failing medical therapy with inotropes and vasopressors. Again, the question of anoxic brain injury comes up, and for patients who are likely to have a severe anoxic brain injury, it is unlikely that treatment with mechanical circulatory support is going to be uh, a life-saving strategy. On the other hand, patients who do not have evidence of severe brain injury might be more likely to benefit. It can be challenging to identify patients with and without anoxic brain injury early in the course and so our general bias is to err on the side of supporting patients in the absence of 
a multitude of unfavorable features. Now, thinking a little bit about the effect of these conditions on patients is really essential. As imminently life-threatening conditions, patients who are victims of cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest in the setting of acute myocardial infarction are at very high risk of life-threatening complications. As I mentioned before, the survival to hospital discharge hovers around 50%, and in some cases may even be lower. In addition, we know that patients with cardiogenic shock who survived to hospital discharge have significant heart disease that places them at risk of subsequent cardiac complications and rehospitalization, often in this setting of heart failure. In many ways, either cardiac arrest or cardiogenic shock is a life-changing diagnosis. And for patients who have both, uh, it can be very challenging to get them to recover to their prior baseline. In summary, the real reason that we wanted to uh, put together this comprehensive review is to highlight how little research has been done specifically in this high-risk population. I mentioned the poor outcomes observed in these patients, and indeed, in some studies, uh, patients with both cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock have accounted for the majority of deaths of all patients who suffer acute myocardial infarction. Clearly, this is a major public health problem, and the time has, has come to focus more of our efforts on identifying better approaches for supporting these patients. At this point, we don't have any established therapies uh, to salvage patients with combined cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock, which really emphasizes the need for not only diligent evidence-based medicine by a thoughtful multidisciplinary care team, but also prevention of predictable complications. This is truly a syndrome where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that you enjoy reading this article as much as I enjoyed writing it in conjunction with my colleagues. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook, you can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.